Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Harm Reduction Task Force question and answer panels. Today, we're going to be discussing harm reduction as it relates to individuals using methamphetamines. We have a very special panel today with special guests. I'll let them go ahead and introduce themselves. Zach, why don't you kick it off? Hi, I'm Zach Coyle. I'm the director of Santa Monica Outreach on the West Side. Hi, I'm Lauren. I am a CES housing navigator at The Nest. Hi, I'm Sean Roman. I'm a substance abuse case manager for the E16. And hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chase Wilson, and I'm the SPA 5 hospital liaison. Um, I work on the West Side. All right, welcome. So let's just dive right in. Um, I think a good place to start would be just a little bit uh, about Meth 101. Um, so let's start with what does someone look like when they're high on meth? How would our staff be able to recognize or tell? Okay, to begin with, uh, you wanna look for rapid movements. Uh, you also wanna look for uh, lack of eye contact, um, sort of other symptoms related to maybe an elevated heart rate, um, agitation, uh, you know, lesions on the skin and face, uh, things along those lines are, are usually a, a good beginning telltale. Thank you, Sean. Does anyone else have anything to add before we move to the next question? I would say also in our street population, um, you'll see kind of people who collect a lot of things. Um, one of the favorite things is kind of taking things apart, like bikes and computer and electronic equipment, um, finding things that seem interesting to deal with. Uh, taking apart is a big hobby on meth, uh, putting back together, not as much, um, but you'll see like large accumulation of things um, that sometimes uh, aren't working, but are, gonna, are like projects. So there's a big thing about like starting projects that don't get finished. So a lot of movements, talking rapidly, um, sort of like, almost like dance-like stuff, kind of like you saw it, sometimes see people kind of popping and walking a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's, especially for like, for, for the, the layman that's really not familiar, I would, I would say, um, just imagine being like hyper, hyper, hyper overly caffeinated, right? Um, lots of jaw stuff like this. People are, are moving their jaws and fidget and inability to sit still, um, counting, picking, lots of picking um, and fidgeting. And then yes, to, to Zach's point, very much um, taking things apart and, and unfinished projects. Who's, who's digging holes at three in the morning in their yard, right? So imagine that it's, this is a powerful stimulant and so people are not gonna be able to sit still and there's going to be lots of fidgeting. Great descriptors, thanks. All right, so um, before we dig in even more, I, I'd really love Lauren to hear your perspective. Um, I know meth affects men and women differently. So maybe you can just share a little bit about um, the effects it has on women versus men and vice versa. Absolutely. So um, after taking methamphetamines, men, seem to, their brains react differently and release three times the amount of dopamine as women. Um, but women are more prone to become uh, meth addicts at a younger age because they start using at a younger age and they develop, <clears throat> um, and therefore they develop at a younger age. Um, but women are also more um, generally open to going to treatment um, and having successful treatments once they're in treatment for, for methamphetamines. Thank you, Lauren. All right, let's hop right into an overview of common slang. Uh, there, I'm sure there's a lot of language, a lot of words that maybe our staff are unfamiliar with. Um, when clients are referring to meth. So Chase, you wanna, you wanna guide us on this one? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I can't imagine that um, a lot of, of clients are gonna say, I've been 
smoking crystal meth, right? And so, but they might say, oh, I've been smoking crystal, or they might say, I've been shooting meth. They might um, use words like Chrissy or Tina. They might say something like crank, um, go fast is a good one, or clear. Um, if you're really in the cuts, you might call it scante. I've been, I've been shooting scante, right? Um, or just define it as like shard or clear, right? Um, I, I, unless um, you're dealing with, uh, oh, I wanna be choice with my words. Nobody's gonna be say, hey, case manager, do you know where I can get help with my crystal meth problem? It's like, oh, I, I can't stop, I can't stop buying shard, can you help me, right? So um, that's kind of an array of different terms and uh, they can be shot or smoked um, amongst, uh, amongst other things, you know, snorted. That's great. I was not familiar with any of those. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have any um, anyone's to add? I've also re heard it be referred to as shit. Sometimes people yeah. call it shit. Um, that's another one. That's right. Then I you'll hear like the catch all, which is dope. Which you know you have to kind of be be up on what you see someone doing when they say I was you know doing dope last night and to me I think heroin or some people might think marijuana but um, dope is this just word for everything um, I've heard tweak geeter is something that they used to use a lot I don't hear that anymore but I used to hear what geeter. was it saying geeter mm. getting getting geeked things like that yeah all right, let's move into the next question. Uh, and this is this is probably a, a, a big one, a big question that most of our staff have. And that's, how do you even start a conversation about someone's meth use? Where, where do you even start? How do you start a conversation? And Sean, let's, let's take that one for you. Yeah, typically, what you want to do is you kind of want to let them lead uh, the relationship in, in pretty much all aspects, but in particular, when discussing anything uh, around risky behavior, sexual activity, substance use. Um, actually, I just found out recently that we are offering sharps, clean sharps to uh, our clients out in the streets. I just found this out today, actually. Um, this is a huge um, step for me in this exact question because this can open up the door to this conversation a lot quicker than you normally would have one. Uh, but typically, I just kind of let them, you know, lead the pace, so to speak. So what if you see that their meth use is really affecting um, their ability to sort of move forward with any goals or with getting housing? And you feel like a, as a staff person that you feel kind of stuck, right? Because you can't really do much with them. Um, and they're not gonna bring up this in a conversation. How, how might you bring it up? Well, I would point out uh whatever it was that happened, like if they missed an appointment, I would point that out and point out the pattern that I'm seeing and talk about what we can do to uh, mitigate that without bringing up the drugs. I would start by talking about that, you know, and then we would have a conversation about um, strategies around that. And then eventually I would kind of lead into that, um, that realm by externalizing it. That's the key here. You have to externalize it. Um, like it's almost like another person. You know, so kind of like if we were talking, you and I it would be like, hey, so what are we going to do about John over there? You know, and we, we, you literally want to talk about it in those terms because it makes it easier for them to be feel like they're free to talk about it in a way that's safer for them. If that makes sense. John, can I ask you to kind of uh, clarify that a little bit? So are you saying that you would say um, you're working with Chase? you think he's using, would you say something like, I have another client who I think is using meth, what would you recommend? Or are you saying like, have them talk about it in the third person? Have them talk about it almost in the third person. I mean, you don't have to be rigid about that, but just kind of letting them know that you're talking about meth, the meth almost like it's not connected to them at all. Like, you know, almost like you know, a broken, something is broken in the corner. You're like, what are we gonna do about this over here? You know, we have, you know, this is standing in the way of our housing appointments. So what can we do to try to, you know, uh, you know not say that that's not there, or that can't be there, but what can we do to try to live with that in a way that we can still make our appointments? 
you know, and just kind of keep it at that level if that's making sense to you. So as opposed to saying like, what are we gonna do about your meth addiction? Just say like, so meth use seems to be sometimes a thing that gets in the way of getting things done. Something like that? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Or just talking about maybe, maybe introducing it in the idea of, um, um, I noticed that when you're, uh, when you've ingested this, it seems like you're, you're less able to answer the questions that the housing authority is asking you or whatever it is. And I'm wondering if maybe we could, you could, you know, we can take care of that after the meeting. After we do the meeting, do that, you know. Um, I'll even give you some new sharps or whatever, you know. Um, just baby steps in, in mitigation and keeping it external so you don't, you know, because all their life they've heard, you know, you, 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 you. So the problem to them is, is them. And you have to separate the two in order to get anywhere, in my experience. Right. And so I think like this is a different thing that I'm hearing a different type of strategy than you'd use with somebody who is dependent on alcohol for appointments where it's like, you're kind of like, Hey, do you need to get well before this appointment? Do, is there anything you need to take care of before we go in for this two hour long appointment? This is more like, Hey, do you think maybe you can hold off, do something different? Maybe we have some coffee before you, this appointment and like, you can take care of yourself later. Something yeah. like that. Those yeah. types of strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Right. And I, I like your point, Sean, about addressing the behavior, right? The missed appointment versus, oh, you know, your drug use is interfering with this, but more like, hey, you missed the appointment. Let's take a look at that, right? So. Yeah, because the minute you start doing that, then you shut, you shut everything down. And when you shut everything down, you, you miss an opportunity potentially in the future to be really helpful. And I would hate to miss that opportunity. Thank you, Sean. Anybody else have anything to add before we jump to the next question? Yeah, I to piggyback on what Sean just said, I think it's important to nearly right off the bat, if, if, if the person is able to really communicate with you, um, to facilitate some kind of dialogue that is, hey, listen, I, nobody's in trouble. I'm not your PO. I'm, I don't manage a sober living. Um, but yo, listen, like, when you're high on meth, it's hard to, to fill out this application. So we, need, so we need to kind of address that. So right off the bat, nobody's in trouble, right? You're not getting written up. You're not going back to Twin Towers, right? You're good, but it becomes challenging to, to work when this happens. So how can we, to, like, to Sean's point, how can we mitigate getting you, you know, enrolled for interim housing, right? And then I, I like to set a precedent that nobody's in trouble and then kind of speak very matter of factly about it. Chase, I really appreciate uh, the authenticity you you bring to that um, to that point. You know, oh, just thanks. being very real. Yeah. All right, all right. Y'all ready to go to the next question? Okay. So, um, sort of piggybacking off that one, um, a little, a slightly different question here is: How do you work with someone? who is actively in a meth-induced psychosis. So Sean, I think you're gonna kick that one off for us. Yeah, uh, the short answer is you don't. Um, what you do is, you know, you know and there's things you can do around that, but, but typically we, you're not gonna really get anything meaningful done, uh, usually in a meth psychosis. Um, so what I would tend to do is, you know, a lot of times when they're in that state, you know, they need water. So, I'd get them water and then back up, get them water and maybe walk away and revisit it maybe later that day or the following day. Um, just let them know that you care and that you're not judging them, you know? Just so what I do is I hand them water, hand them some food. Are you okay? Do you want a blanket? And then bounce, you know, that way it's like a placeholder for, again, being useful in the future. I love that. Thank you, Sean. Anyone else? Yeah, sorry. The risk manager in me just has to say, you want to make sure that they're safe, that they're not um, a harm to themselves or someone else, um, that their medical and like physical health is okay in that moment, because these are really fragile moments for people. They can be actively hallucinating and delusional about what's going on around them. Um, it's, you know, it's it's an oper it's a time a time in which someone can do some a lot of harm to themselves and others and so I think it's important to yeah like put a bottle of water down and you know check them out for a little while maybe 
maybe see if they're friends who are nearby because a lot of times people who are using meth hang out with a crew and you say, hey, is he all right? Is there anything we need to be worried about? We don't want like a 911 call at some point. Like, do you guys think, is there anything I need to know so we can try to get some help now as opposed to like having it be something later? Um, so I just think it's, it's important to do risk assessment um, when people are really, you know, having that kind of, you know, just like anybody who's having any kind of psychosis or delusional or hallucinatory state, whether it's on meth or if it's um, from their mental illness, you just want to kind of assess their, their level of safety. Right. So I'm hearing it's a this sort of non-agenda time, right? You're not going to get any, anything signed or anything done, um, but you really want to be mindful of watching out for their safety, which kind of leads me right into the next question. So good, good segue, Zach. What are some of the most common risk factors associated with using meth that we should be looking out for? And that's for everybody. I would say um, skin infections, abscesses, um, also with like possibly sex trafficking or um, sex work, those types of things. Thank you, Lauren. Okay. Um, and then love, love Lauren's point. Um, we can also talk about just like really basic, uh, like physical things, right? So um, people that are using crystal meth tend to stay up a few nights in a row, right? So you're up all night. So right off the bat, people are tired and people aren't bathing often. Um, people are going to be dirty. They're going to have dirty hands and dirt under their fingernails and they haven't slept or taken care of their teeth, right? You'll hear people use terms like meth mouth, which comes from your mouth being dried out, a lack of saliva. And then you're not brushing your teeth, right? Um, if you're smoking crystal meth, you might burn yourself because you have to heat a glass pipe to an incredibly high temperature, right? So you might have burns on your hands, which can lead to other infections, right? And if you're snorting drugs, if you're crushing the, the crystal meth into, into, into little pieces and then snorting it, people have damage to their nose, right? And um, if you're injecting, if you're, if you're shooting crystal meth, um, all the things that come with, with using, you know, injectable drugs, right? So abscesses, other skin issues, um, cutting yourself, and then all, all, the, all the awful things that come with sharing needles or, or using dirty syringes, right? And ad infinitum, right? So you're staying up late and, and to Zach's point, you're running with the crew, right? And if you're stealing bikes with a bunch of your buddies, things like fights and staying up late and, and bump, bumpings with the police, right? So anything you can imagine that happens to people experiencing homelessness or, or being on the streets, but it's compounded exponentially by being up for four nights, right? So um, it makes for kind of a perfect storm of, of a lot of risky behaviors, right? That then compile, so yeah. Thank you, Chase. Sean, anything to add, Zach? You know, it's just, it's pretty much, it's been covered, but again, you know, the risky sexual behavior, uh, just anything with, with like cleanliness, sharing needles, uh, you know, sharing uh, cookers, you know, sharing pookies, uh, pipes, all that kind of stuff is, is to be, uh, you know, explored and looked at and potentially mitigated. You can. Right, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about, you know, say staff are seeing these things, they're seeing this behavior or um, some of the harm that's coming from these behaviors. What are some strategies um, that staff can implement to sort of reduce the harm um, as, you know, if these behaviors are going to continue? Well, again, uh, like I said earlier, uh, now we're passing out clean sharps. And so that to me is a, is a just, it's a game changer. And so, you know, but that, you know, passing out condoms, uh, water, food, anything along those lines lets, you know, the client know that somebody cares about them or somebody's paying attention. And so just that alone also is a, is a help and mitigation, actually. Any any other things? Oh, I see yeah. you're up. <laughs> I think, um, and this might be answering the other question too a little bit, but um, providing primary medical care. 
to people. They're oftentimes not aware of the kind of subtle injuries that are happening throughout, like, you know, a lot of this activity, taking apart bikes and doing things can lead to lots of cuts and then like lots of dirt and infection. And these are small things that can just blossom into huge things. And there's um, tons and tons of people out on the street who have had like gangrene and different kinds of um, infections that have gotten more and more intense as a result of, of not taking care of it. Basic first aid and basic medical care is really big for this population, I think, um, as is kind of basic mental health care. Um, having someone to talk to, like being up for three or four days in a row is incredibly hard on your psyche. Um, even if you don't go into a meth psychosis, it's just really, really tough on you. And when what goes up must come down. And um, this is a real common time for people to become um, really despairing, depressed. Um, oftentimes, like we were talking about what do you do in meth psychosis, it's like you're not going to get an intervention in right there, probably. Like you definitely are better able to get an intervention in when somebody doesn't feel great afterwards. Um, where they're depressed and they might be willing to explore different options. Um, but you have, it's like there's opportunities in there. So um, sometimes people who use meth, it will trigger things like um, a manic cycle. And so it might not be that they're still high on meth, it's that the, they used meth and now they're into a manic cycle with because um, they have an underlying bipolar disorder. And these are th things that are treatable. But typically not when someone's extremely high, are they going to be willing to sit down with their psychiatrist and do a, an interview? But you can like, you know, have these people available. And I think it's been really helpful to um, introduce things like people who are therapeutic adjacent. That's what I like to think of a lot of our clinical staff, um, therapeutic adjacent throughout treatment. So when you're doing outreach, there's people with you. And it's like, you know, I've had lots of people like, I'll, I'm not going to see a therapist. Oh, well, what about me? Would you talk to me? Sure. Well, did you know that I'm going to happen to be a social worker? I'm happy to talk to you. Oh, yeah, I'll talk to you. You know, or I don't, I don't see a doctor. Well, what about this guy? Would you see him? Oh, yeah, I talked to him. Yeah, I've seen him out here. He gave me a sandwich the last time you were out. Like, just more familiar and casual roles instead of these very formal and defined things, I think are better for this population in general, but particularly people who are kind of you know, on the outskirts of the law and things like that, like where we just don't make as big a deal about the things they're doing all the time and making sure that they attend to like basic nutrition and hydration, like, cause you don't eat. It's a great, it's one of the reasons I think sometimes people get into using meth on the streets uh, is because it allows you to be okay, not having as much food um, and it helps you to maybe drink a little bit more. This is like a typical course of somebody getting involved with amphetamines is sometimes they start using it so that they don't pass out or that they have are more alert for whatever role they have in the world. And the role of somebody on the street is sometimes, you know, you don't want to get taken advantage of. So you might use a little bit just to like make sure your stuff doesn't get stolen um, and stay up all night because it's less safe at night and then sleep during the day. But then these types of things can like, you know, snowball into like full blown regular use. That's a really big one. That, that is a huge one. I mean, that, I would say that's probably 70% of the, uh, the reasons why people that are experiencing homelessness start using meth once they're out there is for that very reason. Which is a great argument for one of the most successful interventions being housing first. Because I have seen this happen. I've seen this happen with people where you think that the way that they are on the street is the way they'll be in housing. And it doesn't always necessarily translate because once they have somewhere to be, sometimes they don't drink as much because they don't need to. Sometimes they don't use meth as much because they aren't trying to stay awake. Like you know, I've seen people go into housing and they like go hibernate, you know, like <laughs> sleep for freaking weeks at a time, like just always asleep. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of this is street coping skills. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So before we wrap it up, I'm going to throw a little bit of a 
curveball question out there that you all haven't prepared for. Sorry. <laughs> but I just want to close with um, think of our staff that are really struggling working with folks using meth and they're they're frustrated and they feel like there's nothing they can do. Um, what sort of advice or, or words of wisdom would you like to leave them with? There's no wrong way to address this. And, you know, we all to some degree are improvising with every client. All of us, every person that we interact with, we're always improvising to some degree. And so, you know, there's no black and white, it's all on a spectrum. And so just do the best you can and consult with other people, you know, and I'm a big believer in role playing, you know, if, if you are, you know, newer and you have somebody on your team that is more experienced, maybe see if you can do a role play, run through a scenario with them and or ask them and, you know, that is really helpful. I mean, that, that kind of thing always helps me. And so I would certainly want to pass that on. All right. Thanks, Sean. I'd say just try to be patient and um, don't take, like try not to take it personal or something if they keep missing appointments because it, it's not necessarily something that they want to do. It's just something that is happening because of their circumstances. Um, and, you know, they could very well want to be making the appointments, but they just physically can't at the time. Wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. Um, they, Lauren and, and, and Sean both made great points. Um, I think it's the nature of the work we do as an as an agency that it look it's it's challenging. We're not selling widgets, right? We're 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 dealing with with people that are are having a tough time. And so, to Sean's point, yeah, there, there's not a one size fits all. I, I agree with that. But but one thing we can always do is this sounds so cheesy. I hate to be this guy, but you you can just lead with with love, right? So I, I'm not here to get you sober person on the street, but will you please drink some water for the love of God? Can I give you a bottle of water, right? I, I, and especially if, if you're a staff member that's unfamiliar with how this works, if you see somebody that seems like they're having a tough time and they can't sit still and they're covered in abscesses, they might be using crystal meth. And yo, do they need a sandwich? And if you can kind of set aside your preconceived notions or, or your fears and really try to lead with love and bounce ideas off of your team, this, this is a collaborative field. Call Carrie or Zach or me or Lauren or Sean, anybody, right? This is um, this field of work. And in my experience, I've only been here for six months, but tends to go smoother when um, we can be collaborative and kind of lead with love. So, yeah. Thank you, Chase. Yeah, I would say like, um, you know, don't, don't, no one expects you to have figured this all out, if, especially as this is like your first job working with this, like, it's not, um, no one thinks you're supposed to know how to do this. Um, but I think it's important to ask for help and to talk with your supervisor and your team or your coworker about the struggles you're having, to seek out information and training. And if you don't know, ask questions or look into it. I think particularly with people who use drugs, but meth in particular, there's a lot of research out there um, that's pretty digestible about how serious of a drug this is and how much it affects people. And it can be very fr frustrating to work with somebody. And when I'm feeling frustrated, I try to find the thing that I can be empathetic about. You know, can I find some empathy for this person in a situation who's frustrating me? And if you understand the like, just this is not the person that they were born into this world as, that this is like this thing that is going on with them. And, um, that they're a human being and in process of, you know, on a journey somewhere. I just think you, you like Chase said, and like Lauren said, and like Sean said, we like got to find the thing that you can like latch onto with them and, uh, you know, not, not be afraid to ask questions. A big thing, I'm a big believer though, that if you are not really comfortable with the idea that people might be using drugs and drinking, and like getting into housing and getting services and like you don't agree with that and you're here because you're trying to get everyone sober this is probably going to drive you crazy and um, you're going to feel real frustrated if your expectations for clients are that they're all going to clean up their acts and everything's going to be perfect so i try to have realistic 
ideas of what success looks like. And um, sometimes success is somebody taking a bottle of water who usually runs away from you or walks the other way. And uh, you got to hold on to that stuff in this work because this is a very, very challenging population to work with. Absolutely. So well said. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was that was really good. <laughs> and I think one of the other things um, I would just like to say to sort of answer my own question, <laughs> one of the best things that you can do for the folks that we're serving, um, you know, regardless of substance use, so what, whatever, whatever it is, whatever they're struggling with, whatever they're going through, um, one of the things that we can do is to hold hope for people, right? A lot of times they don't have hope for themselves and we need to hold on to it for them until they can find that hope for themselves. So with that, I say thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. We hope this was helpful. Check out our other Q&A panels and there will be more to come. Take care. <laughs>